Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. We are very fortunate today to have uh, as our guest, Daryl Bricker. Um, Daryl is the CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs and a very prolific author. And in fact, we're here today to discuss uh, primarily Daryl's latest book called Next, which is about where to live, what to buy, and who will lead Canada's future. Um, just as a reminder for those who have questions, as you're asking the questions or you're writing the questions in the <clears throat> in the tab below that you have. Um, uh, at the end, there's going to be a survey that uh, you'll be asked to complete or fill out, and we are going to be giving away a number of uh, Daryl's book. It's an extraordinary book, and it's ideally suited specifically for Canadians because it's focused on what's happening today in this country. So that's maybe a good segue, Daryl, if I can come over to you and ask you, give me a, a general overview of your book, and in particular, um, maybe a bit more background on your role as the CEO of Ipsos as well. Well, thanks, John, and thanks everybody who's taken the time to sign in for this today. Uh, so uh, the book is really about all of those things that people think that they know that really aren't true. So we have a lot of assumptions about our country, particularly when it comes to the, the people and what the nature of our population is, that when you really take a look at them, uh, those assumptions, you see that we've changed hugely from the country that we used to be. And as a result of that, um, I think that there's a new Canada that is emerging. Uh, there's a new consumer population that's emerging. There's a new leadership group that is emerging. And there is um, a, a new sense of what it is to be Canadian that is starting to emerge. So I, I decided to write the book uh, to be able to communicate what I consider to be the, the, the base case for what Canada is going to be in the future. And what I contemplate is, is really the next 20 years, because who can really think beyond the next 20 years, but really the next 10. Um, and what is likely to happen in our country as a result of the changes that are already going on, mostly, by the way, based on decisions that have already been made. Uh, as the global CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs, essentially what I do is I run all of the social research uh, programs on behalf of, uh, of Ipsos, which is a uh, uh, two billion plus uh, uh, company publicly traded in Paris. I, uh, the division that I run public affairs is, uh, is the biggest service line that we have. Uh, and uh, I am responsible for teams in 40 countries. And I spent until March, uh, most of my life flying around and meeting with them and their clients and talking to them about, about, uh, about programs that we were running to help them understand, understand social change and, uh, and, uh, and particularly government programs in their countries and how they were operating. But obviously I've been doing a lot of what I'm doing today now with, uh, with people as we, we use electronics to try and stay in, uh, stay in touch. And I just wanted to let everybody know that's on the line that, uh, not that this, uh, we're not gonna do any spoiler alerts here, but <clears throat> we're going to ask uh, Daryl to comment on two things here that obviously impact his book. One of them is what COVID has meant <clears throat> post writing the book and where it might modify or change things that um, that he has written about. And the second, of course, it's, it's you know, the elephant in the room <clears throat> is the U.S. election for people in B.C. A, a smaller animal in the room would be our B.C. election. And Daryl's going to comment on both of those. But we're going to hold back on that for just a bit. And uh, maybe we can go into a little bit more into some of the stuff that's in the book, specifically, Daryl. So one of your chapters focuses on <clears throat> mistakes that marketers are making and in terms of how they approach the sale of their products and services based on demographics. So what do you mean by that? We have an obsession with youth and marketing, and it's really something that's emerged since the end of the Second World War, and it stands to reason. It was also driven by demographics. We had the largest increase in our population due to, uh, due to birth in our history. So there was a massive, massive groundswell of youth coming into the marketplace. So what has happened in marketing is we've held on to that idea, that it's all about what's new, what's next, and what's going to be um, most popular and useful to people who are in those most, most youthful categories. But the problem that we have with our youthful category in Canada right now, and by the way, this is the same problem that we have in the, in the Western world generally, is there's not as many of them as we think they are. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is they don't have any money. Um, and there's a whole series of reasons for that, but the millennials- They have as little money as we had when we were young no, kids? No, they have less. And the oh, reason okay. they have less money is because they've taken on a lot of student debt. They've delayed a lot of decisions in their lives that we took much earlier. 
uh, in our lives. And as a result, they're trying to catch up now with 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 being adults and getting their their lives under uh, uh, you know un, uh, get, getting them started and getting them going under much higher levels of debt, mostly due to education, but also things like, for example, buying homes uh, in the most uh, you know troubled real estate market. So you know the one that you're in today and the one that I'm in today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not troubled not troubled if you're an owner, but troubled if you're a buyer. So you know tremendous pressures that have restricted their ability to actually be the drivers of consumer behavior in the population. So what I focus on in the book uh, is what I call the silver tsunami. And I label them not the millennials, but the perennials, people over the age of 50 who have all the money, who have all the best jobs, who have all of the the pensions that the younger people aren't going to be be having, but are basically almost invisible in all of the consumer advertising that we do. So everybody these days is focused on, you know, what's going to happen with the kids? What, you know, what's going to be good for them? And the truth is, it's their parents we should probably be focusing on, or maybe even their grandparents, because most of the growth in the Canadian population today is not coming from birth. We're registering the lowest birth rates in our history. Statistics Canada reported two weeks ago that we were down to 1.45, which is the lowest in the time that it's been recorded. Can you put some perspective on that? Just, you know, just, I'm not sure everybody completely understands sure. maybe the significance of that. Like, could, could we think back 10 or 15 years or, or what replacement rate is just to put context but on sure. that so replacement rate of the population so this is uh just to replace the number of people who are either leaving the country because they've emigrated or because they're dying is 2.1 you need one for yourself you need one for your partner and a little bit extra for those who won't or can't mm-hmm. so 2.1 okay. is the number that we need right the highest birth rate we've ever had in canadian history was 3.9 and it was in 1959 since that date has been in decline. So the average Canadian woman back in 1960 had almost four kids in her lifetime. That was the average. Got married if she got married, uh, probably around the age of 21 or 22, and started her family soon after. And she had four. Today, the average Canadian woman gets married if she gets married around the age of 30, starts her family soon after and has two, if she's lucky. In fact, most households, uh, the the most common household in Canada now with children is a family that has only one child. The fastest growing household type in Canada right now is people living by themselves. In fact, it's also the most common household. So we have this perception of, you know, uh, families and young people and kids defining what the future is going to be. What's defining the future right now is not the number of people coming in, but the people not leaving as fast as they used to. So back in the 1920s, the average Canadian lived to the age of 57. Today, the average Canadian lives to the age of 82. So our population growth in this country basically comes from immigration, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point, and people not dying as fast as they used to. If we The implications are are a bit scary there, Daryl. I mean, sure. Following all of that, th- those numbers, it, it would mean that the current traditional uh, age of retirement is uh, massively off, uh, both practically and financially, not just for Canada, but for, for almost all countries. Like, in your opinion, you know, if age 65 has been that traditional retirement age, uh, what functionally should it be given these significant changes? in demographics, aging, and the skewing of the population overall. Well, the the politics of doing this are different from the demographics of doing it. So obviously, um, the the politics are extremely problematic. Because the other thing about uh, people who are older is they vote. And they vote in much higher proportions than people who are younger. So they're an incredibly powerful part of the uh, political decisions that are made in every country. And by the way, that's common everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, but the demographic realities are that first of all, not only are we living longer for the most part, we're living healthier. So, uh, when you take a look at people retiring these days, there's a willingness to reconsider what employment is going to look like when they get to that age that we would normally consider retirement age of, uh, of 65, where they could probably look at maybe a scaling down rather than an outright ending 
or maybe looking at different types of work. Maybe they don't want to travel as much or, or maybe they, um, they uh, you know, maybe only want to work three days a week instead of what they were doing before. But this idea of a cold stop, first of all, it's not happening in Canada. Most people do it gradually now. And the second thing is our economy actually can't afford either paying them for a cold stop uh, uh, because of the cost, but also our labor force can't lose them um, as quickly as we're going to potentially be losing them, especially as the baby boom aging accelerates. Right. So, I mean, you, you mentioned immigration. Obviously, that's the counterweight to a low birth rate. And um, is that something Canada is going to be able to rely on to yeah, have some kind of level of population increase? Or is that too going to uh, plateau at some point in time? Well, COVID this year really showed the vulnerability of immigration as a source for increasing populations. Uh, our, we've two thirds of the immigrants that were slated to come to Canada this year did not come. Uh, if this continues for another year, that will be another two thirds that didn't come. Uh, and that in terms of our pop, the, the effect on population is it's, our, our population grows at basically about 1% a year. Um, it's obviously gonna flatten from there. And if you're relying on population growth as the driver of your economy, we're, we're gonna have a problem. All right. So, but, but do you think that, I mean, these are people who do actually want to come to the country and functionally can't, either we don't want to let them in because of COVID or they can't get out for the same reason. But does that simply mean they stack up and, and three years from now, we have five or 600,000 people coming in as immigrants and we catch up or do we never catch up? Um, there's some potential that you can do some increases, but the political boundaries around your ability to massively expand your, Im your immigration is limited. Now, Canadians are generally accepting of, of immigration, but massive social change, and we've seen this in Europe, as a result of, of, of immigration, tends to, to bring with it some form of political backlash. So you, you, have to, you have to be very careful about how you manage this. So if you look at the rise of populism in the Western world, it's basically been driven by people's reaction to cultural change resulting from immigration. Right. So... Well, all right, so, so let me segue into something somewhat connected, but not completely connected to that, because it's interesting during this, during COVID, we, we've seen headlines both in Toronto, especially in Toronto maybe, but to some degree in Vancouver as well, where people are talking about um, the impact on housing and essentially really what seems to be happening, I'm simplifying it somewhat, is that downtown condos are flatlining or maybe declining in price while at the same time, you know, single family homes with little space out in the suburbs, it's expanding partially to some degree, people want space, younger families, they don't have to commute as much anymore. There's all of the COVID reasons for doing that. But in your book, before all of this was true, and this was on, you had, you were already a big fan of the suburbs over downtown. So can you explain sort of why you were and it, is, is it COVID that's causing this or is this just something inexorably that was going to happen anyway? COVID's maybe amplified it a little bit, but the evidence on that right now is weak. So a lot of, the, a lot of the, what we've been seeing about uh, increasing home prices in the suburbs is, is probably as much driven by things like reductions in interest rates as it is by, as it is by COVID. So right. people getting into the market. The, the first principle in all of this, John, is that uh, home ownership, regardless of what uh, you know, some uh, critics have been uh, stating about the illogic of, you know, the idea of owning real estate is still seen by Canadians as the single biggest uh, um, investment that they ever want to make. It's seen as a very positive thing. If you're talking about changing people from, you know, kind of a European way of living in flats, which they rent over to, um, uh, to uh, bringing that idea over to Canada, good luck. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really going to happen. There's so much pent up demand for buying homes that we're just going to consider, we're going to see this continuing to happen. And when people decide that they want to buy homes, uh, particularly um, people who are starting families, that's what's pushing them to the suburbs. They want to have, they want to have a bit of space. Now, maybe COVID is going to exacerbate that a little bit, but most of it's driven by that. The thing that we always uh, that I, I see all the time, you know, particularly I live here in Toronto from our city government is, you know, how diverse our downtowns are. Actually, our downtowns aren't di that diverse at all. In fact, if you want to find who lives downtown, look for people who are younger, don't have kids, are more affluent and really well educated. And by the way, disproportionately white. If you want yeah. to see diversity, move out to the suburbs. 
because those are our new entry communities. So, right, it, you know, as immigration picks up again, you're going to see people continue to move into the suburbs. So one of the bigger, uh, uh, I think, challenges in terms of public finance going forward, and, and obviously investment opportunity as well, is how are we going to finance the transportation requirements of the suburbs? Now, granted, we may start to see more people working from home, mm -hmm. but they're going to be working from them in the summer, in, in the suburbs, they're not going to be working uh, in Kitimat and telecommuting to, to, to downtown Vancouver. They're still gonna to wanna to have access to the city. So we're going to, the, the patterns are gonna continue in pretty much the same way, which also indicates the other biggest challenge we're gonna have, uh, one of the biggest challenges we're gonna have going uh, on in Canada is the, is the hollowing out of our rural and small town communities outside of our major, uh, our major uh, metropolitan areas. It's not like people are gonna move out to you know, Prince George. It's not happening. So, th so this is what, driven by, simply employment opportunities or mid to larger size cities are going to draw people like a magnet because they have the critical mass? Like what's the driver here then? Right. So uh, take a look at a, like a city like Thunder Bay or Timmins, Ontario. They, they look like Atlantic Canada. Okay. In terms right. of the population. And the reason is because they don't have the economic dynamism, particularly to attract younger people with ambition and immigrants. So immigrants and younger people with ambition are finding their way into the major metropolitan areas, and that's what's driving demand. And older so, people who are supposed to die and sell off all of these assets aren't dying as fast as, they, as people were thinking they were going to die, and they're aging in place. They're staying in their, their home in West Van. There's no reason for them to leave. Yeah, we boomers have been a pain in the ass for people for so long, and it's just seeming to go on forever and ever and ever. My kids that's keep that's why you're the perennials, that. John. That's why Apparently. you're the perennials. Apparently, so so well, me too, it, I guess. It, it would support, I guess, Daryl, that the thinking that um, there are certain centers. You know, when you think about it from a real estate perspective, you know, people have been talking for a long time about Canadian house prices. You know, way above rents, not practical, not supportable. The Economist magazine's been writing about this for at least twenty years. Um, and not just in Canada, you other jurisdictions, depending on where you're talking about, whether Australia, New Zealand, and certain parts of the US. And it sounds like what you're really saying is that it's very much situational, that you can't look at it as a country, you have to look at it from a regional perspective, otherwise it doesn't mean anything when you're talking about real estate. Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, the Canadian real estate market is a very diverse market based on location. I mean, you know, three rules of real estate, location, location, location. And by the way, you can buy a house really, really cheap in Moncton. Because yes. the population is declining. Um, and there's no young people who want to buy houses in, Mon in Moncton. I actually, I got an, an email from a journalist uh, today saying, oh, you know, we've had a few more immigrants in, uh, in, uh, in Moncton. So do you think things are going to turn around for us? It's like, uh, no. <laughs> No, <laughs> you've got much bigger problems to deal with than that. And I, I shouldn't make light of this. This is one of those public policy challenges that nobody's talking about and is happening under our noses. And it's going to be a big issue going forward, which is rural and small town Canada and what's going to happen with them. Uh, because uh, young people with ambition leave. Uh, older people who have real estate don't. They're extremely expensive populations and they have big, ta they have big tax needs. So um, big service needs. So what, uh, what are we going to do about those places? And virtually, I don't see anybody really talking about it. But it's interesting you talk about this because I read about this in other countries. And, and, and one of the countries I, I really see it emphasized a lot is, interestingly, Japan. I mean, they've got some villages there with, you know, eight or ten people still left in them that are, you know, 90 years old plus And obviously don't want to move for the rest of their lives. And basically, it'll just so slowly dwindle down until the last person is gone, right? Yeah, Japan's a really interesting case. I mean, they're going to lose about 15 million people from their population in the next, I think it's 15 years or something like that. So they're actually where Canada with, without immigration would be headed mm -hmm. now. I mean, we're, we're trailing them, but their J J Japanese birth rate is actually just a bit lower than Canada's. It's about 1.4. Uh, they have the oldest median age population of a major country in the world. It's about 48. And they are losing people every year, about half a million people a year. And uh, uh, we wrote about it in Empty Planet, uh, John Ibbotson and I did. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, the image that comes to mind is the, the fact that there are some towns that are putting um, mannequins and dolls in bus stops uh, because they don't want people to feel lonely. 
because there's oh, nobody really? moving to those towns and everybody's aging out. Schools are closing. Tokyo continues the world's largest city still and continues to grow, but it's actually um, at some point going to start to shrink because most of the growth is actually people moving from the country to the city. So, so how do countries like that? And, and in theory, we may defer this decision because of immigration, but this all leads to at some point in time, a shrinking labor force as in, China's labor force, the last time I took a look at it, I mean, their absolute population is probably going to peak in the next two or three years, but their labor force has actually been slowly shrinking for three or four or five years now. So wh what does this take us when the amount of people actually able to do work in absolute terms is shrinking in large parts of the world? Well, it's, it's a really interesting question. There was a guy, who, uh, professor at uh, Stanford University. I read about it in a, in a column in the New York Times. I never didn't know he was doing this. And he would call it the empty planet effect. So he basically took the idea, he was an economics professor at Stanford, took the ideas that we were talking about in um, an empty planet and said, let's, uh, let's, let's use this to estimate what the economy is going to look like in the future. So he, he posited three options. One of them is we have massive population growth. One of them is that we have basically stasis. We stay relatively even to where we are today, which is about 7.7 .7 billion people, 7.8 billion people. And the other one is the empty planet effect. We start to go down. And basically what he, he, he comes up with is uh, unless there's massive population growth, actually that interim number doesn't exist. You can't it's stay really, in equilibrium then. You can't stay in equilibrium. <clears throat> you have to go to the empty planet effect, which does two has two major effects. It constricts growth. And the thing that he pointed to was the biggest problem is it rest really restricts innovation because innovation tends to be a youthful game. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, maybe older people will become more innovative. Maybe the way that our society changes requires older people to become innovative, but it's a really, really interesting paper and something that John Ibbotson and I didn't think about when we were writing the book, but uh, an interesting brand extension. And I love anything being called the empty planet effect, right? It's a... So, so that raises an interesting question then connected to, I mean, in theory, what you're describing is something that would say you'd have to be massively optimistic to assume that global growth generally in GDP or, or, or per capita income could continue to increase, let's say, at rates that historically it has. And if that's the case, the question that com comes to mind, given how many countries have gone into a staggering amount of you know, monetary and fiscal support during COVID, is can we actually grow our way out of the levels of debt that have been taken on by just a variety of governments all over the world? Or is that just going to be problematic? Uh, I think, uh, you know, I've been reading the same thing that you've been reading. You know, money is free. Let's... Uh, Let's take advantage of it. And by the way, it's just going to be after, just like we did through the Second World War, we expanded our debt massively to, uh, uh, you know, win the fight for freedom. And uh, we grew our way out of it afterwards. And it's like, have you guys actually looked at any demographic projections? Have, have you actually looked at what's happening in the population? Did, did you look at what happened to our demography after the Second World War? Mm -hmm. And are you looking at what our demography is today? And yeah. these are the kinds of things that, that drive me to write books, John. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> because no, I've seen enough. this repeated over and over again in the Globe and Mail, um, uh, you know, on their editorial page. And I've written to them. Uh, and, I, and I said, there is no way, <laughs> unless, you know, grandparents all of a sudden start buying five cars, that we're going to get into a situation where our population growth is going to move us out of this, just like it did after the end of the Second World War. It's a completely different demographic world. I mean, not only is the number of our population going to start to decline, the structure of our population is going to change massively. It's going to be much, much older than it was in the past. So unless we turn those people into consumers, I don't know how that happens. All right, let me switch gears for a second. One of, the, one of your chapters talks, interestingly, about something that would be a surprise to most people today, which is, you know, you indicate that you believe that the um, Western Canada is going to be the driver of Canada's future. Now, given especially, and these are obviously um, uh, COVID realities for the oil and gas industry, is your thinking still the same that the West is Canada's futures, or has that anything mitigated your thinking there at all? I can only go with the data on this, John. And this is why I, I sort of take out things like, for example, what's going to happen to the oil and gas industry? We, we really don't know. 
we, we, re we really don't know. There's a lot of ideology involved in that discussion right now, what, you know, on climate change or, uh, um, you know, on the other side, people talking about the growth of the middle class and, you know, the developed worlds and how they're going to need oil and gas. There's a lot of projections that go on. What I do know, based on the data um, from Statistics Canada, but also um, the data from uh, population projections in places like Alberta, is our expectation is that there has been a massive flight of people from Western Canada and from Alberta over the space, particularly of the last two years. It hasn't happened. In fact, Alberta continues to grow. In fact, Alberta continues to grow ahead of the national average okay. in terms of population. Most of it is a result of immigration. So more as much as the oil and gas issues are a bit of a problem, Probably the bigger issue for Alberta right now is the contraction of immigration and what it's happening right now in terms of mm. COVID and, and not, them not being able to grow as a result of that. Um, so, yeah, I think Western Canada is going to continue to lead the nation. I think uh, suburban Ontario is going to continue to lead the nation. And I think that uh, based, just based on the data and, and what's happening right now, and I think we're going to have a perennial discussion about the, the shrinking of Atlantic Canada. And, and by the way, Quebec looks more like Atlantic Canada than it does look, looks like Ontario or it looks like uh, Western Canada. Okay, so, I mean, when you take a look now at <clears throat> the impact of COVID, which basically primarily came post the book being published, do you, it sounds like you're describing COVID as something that, you know, obviously it's, it's a global pandemic, but at the end of the day, really it's going to defer trends that are inexorable that are going to continue. So maybe there's a, <clears throat> a two-year hiatus or a modification in many of the, the issues you talked about in the book, but they will resurface once we get back to some concept of normal. Does that sound about right? Or do you think there are some permanent changes COVID has now created or will create? Uh, I would say that mostly what we're dealing with that is predictable are speed bumps. So there are things that could be slowed. There's some things that could be maybe uh, accelerated, but the basic trends that are related to the population are all decisions that were made by our parents and mm -hmm. were made by uh, the people who are on this call about the families that they, they're going to have and where they're going to decide to live. And any of those changes are really, really hard to change or are really, really hard to redirect. Uh, I've seen a, 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 an absolute deluge of predictions about how the world is going to change as a result of COVID. By the way, most of it, what the same people were saying beforehand, mm -hmm. but they just see this now as the, the time that it's going to take place. And it's the ideal situation for us to consider what they were talking about before. I don't know that a lot of it's true. It's, it's, it's similar to the, uh, what we were talking to about uh, or talking about before related to debt. And you know how COVID's created this new condition of how debt's going to be assumed and how we're going to deal with it in the future and how we're going to grow our way out of it. It's like, really? I mean, look at the data. I mean, where, where, where are you coming up with that from? I mean, there are certain parts of the economy that are really booming as a result of what's going on with COVID. And there are certain parts that have been really suppressed. Let's see what happens over the space of the next 18 months. And mm -hmm. then maybe we'll be able to talk about trends. I, th I think basically what we're seeing right now are a lot of blips. So... so it does raise an interesting question though, Daryl. Um, when you take a look at the environment and consider your book and then consider the current environment, do you see sort of, let's go, let's go forward you know, 10, 15, 20 years and look for winning industries and let's say winning and losing industries, areas basically where above average growth is likely to be realized against areas where essentially the decline might be accelerated. Do you, can you bifurcate the, the outcomes that you see is, and let's say we're specifically talking about Canada. Anything to do with big cities, anything to do with metropolitan areas, particularly suburbs, I'd start my thinking with that because that's where everybody's moving to. Anything that has to do with that group that I call the perennials because they have all the money and there's tons of them. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in just about every advertisement that you see on television, just about anything that, you know, ads that you see, except, you know, other than, you know, for specific medical situations or whatever, uh, they're almost invisible in all of our consumer activity, but they have all the money. Mm -hmm. they, are, uh, they are the untapped resource in, in the marketplace. And then anything that has to do with youth, really calibrate your thinking based on the, the, the size of the, um, the wealth they represent combined with the fact that, um, that they're not as big a group as they, they used to be in the past. So for example, should you be investing in, in, um, in, uh, um, vacation opportunities for older people or amusement parks for kids. 
Well, I think it's pretty obvious that. Right. Fair enough. You should probably be looking at making Disney World more amenable to older people <laughs> rather than to making more rides for little kids that are really loud and have cars that are too small that you can't get um, your, your mobility device into uh, that, that, that really cater to the fact that maybe it's an expanded family that you're going to be dealing with, not just the little kids that are part of that family. So if you're so pandering to older people at Disney World, basically that you would build more teacups and fewer uh, roller coasters. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I go to Disney World every year because it's my daughter's favorite place in the world. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I would say, and I haven't done a count, and I should the next time, but I see as many mobility devices as I see strollers. Oh, yeah, I bet you do, yeah. Yeah, that wouldn't so the question is, what is that? What's going on? What are the underlying drivers of that? Because a lot of those people on the mobility devices probably wouldn't have traveled 40 years ago to Disney World. No. Yes. So travel then becomes, I mean, still a growth industry, although it looks completely decimated today. So that's an industry, yeah. for example, you would see as recovering as soon as the risk of um, uh, disease is uh, reduced or, or eliminated. Right. And here's the other thing I would say, uh, and it's one when I say it, it requires a little bit of an explanation. So be patient with me, please, John. I'll sure, try not okay. to be boring. Um, older women. Right. Completely ignored in consumer marketing, unless there's something specifically for them. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but looking at them as like a mainstream market rather than as a specialty market. And the reason is because there's lots of them. Mm -hmm. And that is the, one of the fastest growing parts of the population. And the reason for that is that, interestingly enough, and this is one you can whip out at your next cocktail party as a, as a, a stat tester for all your friends, are there more boys born every year or girls born every year in Canada? I, I, I was way back in the day, I, I seem to remember it's slightly ad advantageous to boys because whatever, they seem to have a higher mortality rate and to make things even, it, that's it, the way it, it works It out. actually is. You're absolutely correct. Always more boys than girls in any country in which there isn't an artificial um, intervention mm -hmm. to cause, uh, to, to, to even increase the number of boys even more, like in China and India. Mm -hmm. uh, by the age of 30, that advantage is gone. Okay. Every year after that, there's more boys than there are, or women than there are men. By the time you get to the age of 65 and the ratio is 55 to 45, women over men. By the time you get to 100, and we think, oh, whoever gets to 100, there's a, over 11,000 Canadians now who are 100 years of age or older. Mm -hmm. The ratio is five to one. We have this assumption. We all basically know that, old, that women outlive men. And we assume it's that old women outlive old men. No. That's not what happens. It's every year after the age of 30, uh, actually just about every year, men tend to outlive, or women tend to outlive men. Okay. Every year. And that gap tend, continues to expand. And the reason for that is of the 20 reasons that, uh, that the World Health Organization has identified of premature death, 16 of them are more frequent among men. Only four more frequent among women. Three of them are specifically uh, biologically related to women, men can't really get them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is Alzheimer's because they, they live longer. 16 other reasons of the 20 are more prevalent among men. Men are three times more likely to commit suicide, for example. Really? So, that surprises me. I, three times okay. more likely. Yeah. Uh, actually, three times more likely to uh, succeed, but the number actually attempting is about similar. Okay. Just men pick men pick more lethal methods. Uh, so the um, the the what this does is it creates this gulf in which there are more women in the population than men, and it increases every year. So back in the 1970s, there were more um, uh, men in the Canadian population with, than women. Now there are more men in the Canadian population or women in the population than men, and the gap grows every year. So the question I have for marketers is, what are you doing for older women? Because that's a fastest growing part of the population. They tend to have a lot of money. We have this idea that there's all these old destitute women living on their own. In fact, they're the happiest segment of the Canadian population, older women. So what are we doing to market to them? Do me a favor and don't explain that to my wife. Is that all right? <laughs> yes. You good with that? Or my wife, yes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but uh, th I mean, these are things like when you start to dig and you go down that rabbit hole and you start looking at, at the data, 
and not just look at it as numbers, but look at it as people and, and life stories and decisions and, and what the narrative it is that you get out of what's happening to a, a citizenry or a population. You have a lot of clues about what the future are going to look like that too many people ignore, which is why I wrote the book. Okay. Well, can we sw- a segue? Uh, in the, we have a certain amount of time left. Let's segue to politics. Let's just start with the, you know, the easy one. I'll, let me give you the, you know, I'll throw the softball for you. We have a, an election coming up um, in BC in about 10 days time. Um, um, how do you see it playing out and, and what are your thoughts about the outcome? I think it's pretty clear that unless there's a, a fairly apocalyptic event between now and election day, uh, that the Horgan government's look uh, poised to win a majority. Uh, the official opposition will be the Liberal Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the opposition leader's big chance to get back in the game was probably last night in the debate. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were doing <clears throat> minute by minute tracking through the course of de- the debate on behalf of Global News. And uh, I w- let's just say he didn't punch through. Okay. Uh, so mm-hmm. um, my suspicion is, or actually my, if I had to bet my own money on it right now, I would, I would bet that it's going to be a Horgan majority. So do you see that implying that there'll be a number of changes within the Liberal Party, including the leadership itself? Well, you know, it used to be that leaders got a couple of kicks at the can, that uh, party memberships tended to be uh, more patient. But as we saw with the federal Conservative Party, um, patience is fairly limited these days. If you're a member of the NDP, it tends to be a little stronger. I mean, Jagmeet Singh got his you know, lost half, almost half his caucus in the last uh, federal election mm-hmm. and he was allowed to stay on. But uh, um, with um, uh, Thomas Mulcair, they threw <clears throat> him out, which is the NDP tends not right. to do that. Yeah. So I would say that uh, uh, if there's uh, uh, an ambitious leader or a couple of potential candidates in the Liberal Party in, uh, in British Columbia, there's probably going to be some leadership pressure. And do you expect to see a federal election next year? Uh it depends on where the numbers go. The, the Liberal government was angling to set up the conditions for, a, uh, for um, uh, its uh, majority election uh, through the process in the lead up to its speech from the throne. And that simply didn't happen. In fact, they had to roll back on an awful lot because Canadians kind of regarded their, uh, their view of this once in a generation opportunity for this green, major green recovery that was gonna take place as, um, kind of out of touch with what people were going through and almost cavalier. Mm-hmm. So they really had to roll things back and really focus on fighting the pandemic, which is where people are focused right now. Um, but the Liberal Party, in spite of the fact that it gets reasonably good numbers, uh, the federal government in terms of its performance in, relative to managing the pandemic, uh, it hasn't really translated into big support for the Liberal Party, similar to what we've seen, say, for example, for the Liberal or the, the NDP in British Columbia. Um, the Liberals have found a way to bring partisanship back into politics, which doesn't exist in most other jurisdictions in the country right now. And that was as a result of the WE controversy. So if the Conservatives are able to get that back up and running again, uh, and they're certainly trying at the moment, I expect that, uh, yeah, it's going to be tough for the Liberal Party. They've got to open up a gap because right now um, they basically have a minority majority. They have to have three parties vote against them in order to knock them off. And that's a really hard thing to get any three parties to agree on. So Mm -hmm. they can govern for a really long time. Uh, But um, every minority government wants to be a majority. So they have to set the right conditions for that to happen. The conditions for them right now are not favorable. Right. So then nothing this year for sure. And then, but maybe something next year. Uh, If you talk to the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, political observers in Ottawa, their expectation is it would be in the spring. But as I said, unless they can open up a gap and get some momentum, which they don't really have um, it's, it's not really logical that they would want to uh, test their chances with, uh, with an election. So, so realistically, and when we take a look at the economic outcomes, it would appear, at least our, our personal view is it appears that we're sort of at some economic uh, um, plateau where um, things are not necessarily going to get materially worse, but they're not necessarily going to get materially better. And they we're just going to kind of bob along, you know, a bit like a duck in, you know, in a pond and not see a, any upward momentum until there is a very material way of eliminating the, the risk from COVID, not just the infections and the deaths, but the ability to 
engage certain kinds of economic activity. And, and based on what we're looking at, we're talking easily could last the rest of next year. Do you see it the same way? Yeah, uh, it's, well, in terms of, you know, how economies respond, I, I think it's really driven by what people decide to do. I mean, there's other decisions that can be made by central bankers and, you know, uh, you know, big industries or whatever. But uh, if you look at it from the perspective of consumers, uh, the Canadian consumer population has really not moved a long way from where they were in March and April. So we're talking about a post-COVID recovery. We're not post-COVID. Yes, of I course. mean, and, yeah. and uh, you know, people, uh, the, our healthcare professionals and governments did a very good job of preparing people for what they saw as a second wave, and people feel that they're living through it now. So until they they believe that we've actually found a way to control this disease and that the numbers every day are showing a steady decline over a protracted period of time, mm -hmm. uh, the likelihood that they're going to re-engage at the level that would lead to econo significant economic growth other than just recovering to maybe a bit of where we were before, uh, it would be, I, I think, uh, overly optimistic. Okay, so... All right, well, let, let's, um, let's switch gears to our favorite contact sport, U.S. politics, <laughs> and walk me through, A, what your thinking is. I mean, you've just heard both a, a presidential and a vice presidential debate, and you can see the polling numbers and, and the, all of the other stories. Is there, is there any way to provide some context for Canadians about you know, what we're seeing in the U.S. and maybe what we should expect on November 3rd as well? Well, what we're seeing is uh, a country that's really being driven by two issues. There's a lot of other issues below that, but at the top of the ballot, there's two issues. One of them is COVID and the other one is the economy. To the extent that the public is most focused on the economy, Trump will do better than maybe the polls are suggesting right now. Mm -hmm. To the extent that they're focused on COVID, Biden will do better than maybe the polls are suggesting right now. So all you have to ask yourself is what are people talking about at the moment? You can see it in the polls, but you can also see it in all the coverage that you're that that we're dealing with, and uh, you know all of the conversations you're having with your friends south of the border. People right at the moment, particularly since the president contracted COVID himself, are really talking about that issue. And every day that they're talking about that issue and not talking about the economy is a good day for Joe Biden. So right. the poll the polls have been steadily improving for uh, Biden and the Democrats uh, since probably the last 10 days. Um, and uh, now, uh, if you look at the real clear politics average, um, the, uh, the, the average of polls right now has Biden with a 10 point lead in the national polls. In the battleground states, it's about five. So, so, so interestingly, I mean, if there's, n there's not gonna be another presidential debate, which Trump is the one who's tr triggered that decision. And uh, the Democrats can outspend the Republicans two to one. So basically, doesn't that sort of give them the decided advantage going forward the next two or three weeks? So my professional, uh, with my professional hat on as a, as a public opinion researcher and political pollster, I'm supposed to say that anything can happen, mm -hmm. but that anything is really, really, really hard to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. So, so it's an interesting question, though, that, I mean, obviously the U.S. is, become incredibly polarized, but it would be wrong to suggest that it's only, the only Western country that has become polarized in its thinking, politics, its culture. Is this, is this like a permanent trend we're seeing on some, maybe not totally global basis, but certainly a lot of countries being impacted? And, and, and if it is, is it demographics actually that are is driving this in the first place? Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at what the single biggest factor is that drives um, the rise of nationalist populism, it's cultural change. So the biggest driver of cultural change is immigration. So if you look at the countries that have had the biggest rise in particularly right-wing populism, they've been countries that have uh, fought battles over that. I mean, going back to the Brexit battle in, uh, mm -hmm. in, right. in the UK yeah. through to uh, you know, what's happening in Eastern Europe, through to what's happening in countries like Spain and Italy, in other places, there's this, you know, COVID and the economy have obviously taken that over, but uh, the animating force for, uh, for um, populism has basically been cultural nationalism. But Canada so, seems to have managed to mitigate that in relative terms to these other countries, not zero, but it does seem significantly less considering as a percentage of 
our population, our immigration rate is two or three times that of the U.S. Yeah, and it's the, it's uh, we compete with Australia every year as to whether it's the highest proportion per uh, per capita in the world. But uh, the reason for that is because it's now become such a large part of our population. Mm -hmm. Over 20% of the Canadian population is foreign born, which is an incredible number compared to the rest of the world. I mean, the way I described it uh, in another book I wrote called The Big Shift uh, with John Ibbotson um, is, uh, you know, in peacetime, the biggest movement of people into a single country, you know, outside of maybe the reunification of Germany that we've seen is the number of people that have moved into particular major metropolitan areas in Canada. Mm. We've basically created new, two new Torontos over the last 20 years. Okay. All right. People coming into the country and, and in a relatively peaceful way. And so what's happened is that the balance, particularly in terms of our political power, involves a lot of new Canadians. So it can't be an animating force. Anti-immigration is not going to be a big animator of, of Canadian politics because it can't be because of the change in our population and in particular the geography of where immigrants have moved. Every immigrant, every election can in Canada now, national election is decided in the suburbs of our major cities that are disproportionately foreign born populations. So you can't basically run against them. <laughs> so let me ask you to do it's this. different in other could, countries. Because Daryl, I mean, I think a lot of the things we've talked about, you know, pe people could look at that and say, wow, boy, that those glasses are all half empty. Okay. In terms of the- It is outcome. what it is, John. It is what it is. No, no, fair enough, Daryl. But I'm, let's say I was asking you, just talking to the people that are listening in today to say, what would you see are as the most positive things from a Canadian's perspective to look forward to over the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years? The most positive thing I think is that we can, we're going to have a greater recognition of the diversity of our population. So if we come to grips with the idea that, for example, older people are relevant people, that's gonna be important. We're gonna have a diversity necessity in this country. Uh, we're gonna need every, you know, working person <laughs> to be available to, to, to drive our economy. And I think the fact that we've developed this level of tolerance and, you know, uh, there are intolerant things that happen in Canada, but it's all relative. I mean, my job is I'm the global head of public affairs for, for Ipsos. So I'm traveling all over the world. I've seen what real intolerance looks like. Yeah. Uh, we've got a lot to, uh, we've got a lot, a lot to live down to if anybody really wants to claim that we're an intolerant country. We do have issues that we have to deal with, certainly on the indigenous file, certainly um, anything that has to deal with, um, uh, uh, you know, people of color in this country, trying to find ways of making sure that we can all live together peacefully will be an ongoing challenge. But the, 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 um, the uh, reservoir of tolerance that we have in the population is a really great asset that I think will help us get there. Um, so I, I actually look forward to Canada being quite a successful country going forward because we have figured out a way, particularly through things, for example, like immigration, to be able to work through some of these other problems that other countries are really confronting. Uh, and, and you know, if we have an honest conversation, for example, about uh, you know the older population who are living healthier being a more vibrant part of our our population going forward, both as consumers, but also as, as you know, sources of uh, sources of labor in, in, in our workforce, I think we're going to have even a better country going forward. But uh, uh, that also brings with it the challenge that we're going to have to deal with what I think is going to be some real generational pressures between younger people who had all of these aspirations about what their lives were going to be. It hasn't quite turned out that way. So we, we do have some sources of tension, but I generally think that we've dealt with them better than a lot of other places have. Okay. Well, let me go um, now, Daryl. I, you know, we have a number of questions here, so let me start with the first one. This is from uh, Norm Taylor. So he he writes: I've heard conflicting stats that the birth rates will increase as a result of COVID, par par parenthetically, more sex versus pandemic, and fear of bringing people into this world, so rates will drop. Okay. So in other words, he's, there are you know either COVID is going to help the birth rate or make it worse but not leave it neutral. Uh, so uh, John Ibbotson and I wrote a really good long essay in the Globe and Mail about a month ago about this. Okay, all so right. So I invite you to take, so I won't get into all the details on the stats, but you can go there and you can take a look at it. Bottom line is when people are fearful about the future, they stop having kids. K kids are a statement of hope. Mm -hmm. And when you're fearful about the future, you stop. 
And so what the, the evidence is, in spite of people saying, you know, we have, uh, you know, snowstorm baby booms, or we have, uh, uh, you know, brownout baby booms or whatever, nah, it tends not to happen. If you go back and you take a look at it, uh, they, uh, it, it tends not to be the case. Uh, if you go back to 2008, 2009, when we had our last big global recession, uh, baby uh, birth rates, fertility rates were crushed. So um, my expectation is that uh, we're going to see a continued decline in, uh, in birth rates as a result of what we're going through right now. Yeah, I remember actually thinking about the thing, going back to really old demographics, but there was a very significant birth dearth on a global basis during the Depression. Uh, and interestingly, the birth rates uh, for a lot of countries were higher during the war years, which would be, sound almost impossible, than they were in the 30s, right? And, and I remember it impacted a number of businesses. Somebody was going into, <clears throat> going into um, the funeral home business and just based on core demographics said, well, obviously more people are getting older, so I'm going to do better. Unfortunately, they went into that business just as the people who were born in the 30s would have otherwise passed away, except they, the actual percentage they were of the population had shrunk. So essentially, they, these guys went out of business on the basis that they simply ran out of customers. Not that you should feel too sorry for a funeral home, but still. Actually, funeral homes would probably be a pretty good place to be right now. They probably are, I would yeah, think. Because, uh, um, but uh, the, um, yeah, I, I, I would, I would expect that. Uh, and by the way, there's a great study. The Brookings Institute took a really good look at this, mm -hmm. and uh, basically confirmed what I'm just saying, which is that expect that you're going to see a, a further decline in infertility rates. So here's another question. It, it goes as follows: The imminent wealth transfer seems to be the biggest opportunity for advisors. Given the statistics you reviewed as they pertain to population and immigration, what would the two um, areas be that you would recommend we, we as advisors, focus on? Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of the wealth transfer because I hear it when I talk to financial people all the time. And so the two things I would say is that it's probably going to be more gradual and uh, smaller than we think. So and people will is, hold on to their money longer. Right. right. So the challenge for people in financial services is to figure out a way that they can transfer that money in a productive way, particularly to their children, as they still remain alive. Right. So if you're looking at, it, at the ultimate event as being the trigger for the wealth transfer, that's probably um, going to be pushed off. And mom and dad, um, particularly mom, uh, is probably going to live longer than we expected and live healthier longer than we expected. And we'll be having more fun on that money than we may have expected. And yeah. maybe using it to also pay for additional healthcare services. No, all of those things. In fact, I, uh, we, it has always occurred to me that, you know, if you take a couple and as you say, reasonably good health, first off, the amount of resources they need to ma maintain financial independence is not inconsequential, especially if they own their own home that's ge not generating any income. So the, Giving away capital is not necessarily a given issue unless they happen to have significant wealth. And in generally, their kids do not want to be able to have to support them when they're in their 80s or 90s as well. So therefore, if they're financially independent, that takes a burden off their, the children themselves. The children could be in their 60s by the time they actually, quote, get the inheritance. And so the whole framework changes. You're not trying to worry about, I have to figure out how to, let's say, relate to this millennial that's going to get this big inheritance, because I would suggest that the number of millennials that are going to get a big inheritance is a very, very small number. Yeah, I actually wrote about this next, and, and the public opinion data go along with this, so we've culturally adjusted as well. So the idea that you're going to get an inheritance small minority of Canadians believe that that's going to be the case. The second thing is if they, uh, they think that their parents are going to have a worse retirement as a result of get, giving them an inheritance, they'd rather have their parents spend the money on themselves. Yeah, and I, I, that's my sense of what we see as well. I, I, yeah. That seems to make a lot of sense. Um, I just want to remind everybody, we've been focused primarily on Daryl's book. Somebody was asking about which book we we're talking about that you had written. So the book both. is well, you get both, and in fact, they're they're great books. Um, but Thank the you. first book we talked about was called *The Empty Planet*. That was a book that Daryl had written last year. This year, the book that I'm suggesting everybody should want to read is called *Next Next*. 
I mean, and if you're a, a, a remotely in, interested in not just how demographics plays, but how things work out, but also if you're in business and you're trying to understand the markets for your products and services, uh, you, it, the information in the book is invaluable. It's a great book. Um, all okay. right, so Daryl, here's a question from Rob Lucy, and I just want to be sure I'm getting the whole question here. Okay, here we go. Okay, he says, a couple age 70s, 20 years left, live in BC with some resources. Are we lucky or are there challenges coming? So he, presumably Rob's talking about his own situation. So he's got 20 years to go. And uh, wh what are we thinking? I mean, he, he should feel pretty good or not? I think he should be feeling pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, you know, all the big life expenses have, have already been paid for. We've got public health care, which all of his fellow 70-year-olds are going to continue to lobby for. Um, nobody's going to be going after pensions because no politician dares to do it. Um, so yeah, I think you should be feeling pretty good. Um, okay. All right. So this is from Evan Turner, uh, who actually is uh, one of our advisors. And he asked this question, how does productivity uh, change per individual due to technology growth help offset the population declines expected in Canada? And maybe this would be more correct globally. It might be less of a population decline here in Canada. Well, Japan's struggling with it right now, and that's the reason that they're obsessed with, uh, with service robots. But even with technological productivity, they're now reconsidering their policies on immigration and looking at places like, for example, Dubai, which have visitor uh, you know, worker programs uh, because they, they simply don't have the people to care for their population. I but mean, but isn't, the isn't part of the problem, I mean, Japan seems to show and never has shown any interest in trying to develop an actual immigration they, they policy. have I mean, none they have not right? i was uh, i was at uh, the halifax security forum a couple of years ago and this was one of the topics that uh, that we talked about and i was on a um, a panel with a, a japanese demographer and he was the one who talked about this topic mm -hmm. which was visitor worker programs and i'm thinking back here's the thing about immigration and, and we should say this as, as, as well john it's a temporary solution Okay. It's only a temporary solution because it relies on countries having excess populations and all of those places where Canada is getting excess populations right now are running out of excess people. Right. So Ch China, China's birth rate is lower than Canada's. Yes. Yeah. China is about to go through a demographic catastrophe with aging and, um, and with, um, and with a lack of fertility. Uh, the estimates that you saw in the Lancet report were showing numbers that were like 500 million fewer people in China over this century. Right, I mean, which is, you know, a breathtaking number because, you know, that's uh, basically uh, one and a half um, uh, Americas. You right. Know, uh, <laughs> and, and that, and that, but that's basically what's happening. I mean, even the UN has adjusted down their stats and their latest modeling by 300 million people. And you say, oh, 300 million people, that's hardly any. That's the United States. Yeah, no, no, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Um, here's another question. All right, um, to what extent do you think that climate change will have an effect on the changes we face moving into the future? For example, do you see a possibility that activism will bring about a change to historical norms in terms of voting demographics or is the voting power of the perennials too strong? Uh, well, the, the assumption there is that the perennials are also aren't worried about climate change. And the answer is that they are. So if you look at the consensus of political opinion and political weight in Canada right now, there is no national political party that is not going to have a climate change policy in the next national election. Mm -hmm. Andrew Scheer was the last one who flirted with it. And uh, you saw what happened to him. Now, granted, he did win the popular vote, but he lost the national election. Um, uh, you're not going to see a national political party, and you've seen this with Aaron O'Toole as the leader of the Conservative Party, now talking uh, about some sort of a low-carbon future that involves the oil and gas industry. Uh, not addressing climate change is not an option. The interesting thing, though, that has happened with climate change in terms of the level of urgency that people uh, uh, have on it at the moment, it's really declined since the last election, and that's because the space has been filled by concern about the pandemic and the economy. So, so why is it, Daryl, that I, I always find it's a, you know, an interesting paradox because in my mind, especially when you come to transportation and energy, which are very big global industries as a percentage of global GDP, and then you take a look at, let's say, climate change, and you, you're really talking about innovation and sustainability and all of the other things that go with it, which is obviously non-carbon based uh, energy and, um, and non-fossil fuel um, transportation modes. And so... 
I look at that and ask myself, okay, well, that by itself is an opportunity from an industrial perspective. And if I looked at energy, um, renewable energy will grow faster than energy overall. And electro, uh, car, uh, carbon free transportation will grow faster than transportation will overall. So from an investment perspective, why is it everybody looks at climate change as a liability as opposed to actually an economic opportunity? Because it doesn't ever get presented that way. You know, it's interesting from the perspective of people who are involved in investment, um, people who are senior political leaders, other than those that are really dependent on uh, energy economies right now. I'm, I shouldn't say energy, I should say petroleum based economies. Um, you really won't have a, 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 an argument over anything that you just said. I don't see anybody mm -hmm. really arguing very much to the contrary. The issue with climate change is what does one do about it? Mm -hmm. So you, you get the vast majority of the, of the world population actually saying, yes, I believe the climate is changing. Yes, I believe human beings are responsible for it. Yes, I think that we should do something about it. And then governments try to implement something to deal with it. And the public's basically at best divided on a carbon tax, um, aren't buying electronic cars or electric cars, um, aren't prepared to pay any more in terms of uh, their personal wealth to support uh, low carbon initiatives from anywhere. And, and essentially in terms of their consumer behaviors, um, uh, except for people who are more activist in the way they look at these things, not really adjusting what they do. So yeah. there's a difference between what we, what we think the challenge is and what we're prepared to do in order to affect that change. And the problem I find with people on the climate change activism uh, front, sorry, Greta, in spite of all the impact you've had on the world, is lecturing people about the fact that this is important. We're past that. They're already there. So lecturing them and shaming them isn't going to do anything. It's coming up with practical ways of having them effectively uh, change their, their habits to uh, do things that are beneficial uh, to a carbon-free economy. So it's not about winning the, uh, you know, the debate points and not looking like you're a smart or caring person and doing the hearts on your chest and all the rest of it. Practical people want practical solutions and that's not what they're getting. They're getting no, I, still a lot of ideology, a lot of big dreams, you know, a lot of, you know, guys in mock turtleneck sweaters talking about the future 25 years from now. When people are thinking about tomorrow right now, they're, they're literally thinking, John, about Thursday. No, that's no, and where, I hear that's you. That's where our minds are. And I think, but there are some interesting options that are occurring in sustainable uh, um, energy and innovation that are actually practical enterprises that are going, uh, that are going to be viable as investment strategies immediately. And um, I think the growth rate of that will increase. And I, I, I agree with you that the it, it, business's responsibility is to a large degree is to say, we'll develop the solutions because the customers, as you point out, are there once you actually have something to give them that they can actually use and make sense from their perspective. So let's talk about Canadians for just a second. Okay. And I promise I'm going to, I'm going to ask this as a skill test and question just because. All right. Fair enough. Think. What is the number one male occupation in Canada? The number one male occupation. I assume you don't mean a male stripper. So I, let me just think what else it could uh, be. It's a surprising your mind went there, John, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No problem. All right. Let's just think about this for a second. I would say, I don't know. A plumber. I don't know. I have no idea really. Truck drivers. Okay. All right. All right. That so sort of... take just what you said. Yeah. And apply it to a truck driver. Yeah. So how are we going to make them part of our solution? Oh, how are we so going to talk I believe, to this about I, this? I believe I actually might have an answer to that one because basically one of my friends and he's part of a group that I have, CEO group that I'm involved with is the CEO of Ballard Technologies and they are spending Ballard, huge yeah. amounts of, mon amount of money on fuel cell technology specifically for heavy freight transportation to get ranges that are significant. And they are, I would say, quite close to developing solutions that are going to, uh, to get there. And whether, I don't know whether this firm Nikola ever becomes anything we, we have yet to see in terms of trucking and transportation, but at least experiments that are trying to look at what would make a difference for a truck driver are being considered and put in place. So usually what they hear is uh, electric, and autonomous so they yeah. put the two they put the two of them together so you're a truck driver what do you think 
No, no, fair enough. Okay, so as long as you try and pretend that the guy's going to be out of work, yes, you're right. Okay, but if the issue was simply, this is a better truck, and it costs a lot less money to run, but, but and all those how, things. No, I get you it. see how important demographics are? Yeah. That simple fact that the number one male occupation in this country is truck driver changes the entire conversation about climate change. No, I, I hear you. I do hear you on that. And I, and, and I think part of it is that whether one has an autonomous truck, unless you have a labor problem, isn't the issue. Whether you have an actual uh, pollution-free truck would be a far greater um, progress in, in the outcomes you're trying to achieve. And this is where we have to get our big thinkers to get off the, the pedestals, stop doing this to people, and start understanding that what you're asking people to, to accept is significant change in their own personal lives. And you have to be able to link the efficacy of the changes that you're making, make them acceptable, which is going to affect climate change. Right now, we've got too many people wagging their fingers with too many big dreams that frankly scare a lot of people. So while, yeah. they're, while they're aligned with the idea that we need to change um, the climate, telling them that they're going to have to pay a lot more to do it, and that they're going to have to accept, you know, autonomous vehicles, or we're going to get rid of your furnace, or we're going to do, uh, it's like, just stop. Just yeah, no, okay, fair enough. You're making the problem worse. All right, so we are, uh, we are a little over time. I just want to let everybody that's on the line understand we are recording this. So basically, um, if you don't get all of it and you have to go, don't worry about that. Um, I would like, Daryl, to ask you one more question, because this sure. is kind of an interesting one that relates to our reality, our COVID reality now. Um, and it goes as follows. Given your comments about outlying areas like Moncton or Victoria with a global work from home experiment we have all experienced, will people choose to work more from remote locations beyond suburbs of major cities? Unless they're university educated and they're part of that global symbolic economy, probably not. So in other words, they still have to be within reach of, let's say, their quote, home office or where their employer is. I'm a truck driver. Yeah. I mean, th this is the problem. We see the world through our own little straw. Mm -hmm. You know, our, fr our friends that are around us and you know, maybe the people who are in our family who may be university educated, um, you know, they work in the symbolic economy. Maybe they work for a global corporation. Maybe they work for finance. COVID's actually not been that bad for them. They've enjoyed being at home. They don't have to be on yes. airplanes as much. They, right. you know, they're, they're, there's a, there's, their lives haven't changed. If you're a federal public servant, you haven't contributed anything to this in terms of pay. You probably can't even log in on the VPN because the, <laughs> the system for the federal government, it's, it's actually been fairly slack for you. Yeah. Um, it's not been, but there are people that have been, just been devastated by this. Just Absolutely. Yeah. And there, there are, are a very, very major part of our economy. So I keep coming back to this number, which is the truck driver. That's the number one numerous op occupation in uh, Canada. I think for women, it still is, uh, it still might be uh, uh, teachers and nurses, but, but the, um, uh, I'll have to look that one up, but you can, it's on the StatsCan webpage. In fact, I write about it in next. Okay. But, so when you think about, you know, how is the world being affected by this? Think of those people. Don't think about the guys who are on Bay Street or on, you know, on in, uh, you know, in, on Hastings in, in in Vancouver or Robson, uh, you know, living, you know, th that that type of a life. That's a small segment of the Canadian population. And yeah, they can live anywhere, but most people can't. No, fair enough. Well, listen, um, Daryl, we are. Uh, we are a little over. This has been fascinating. We really could go on for a long time. Uh, well, have I just me back. Say, I'd be happy to come back. I would, well, you know, I, I would I would love to do that. And there are just so many things to cover with this. Um, but I want to thank you a, for being for joining us, being participating, being so enlightening to, for us. Um, just a reminder for people, um, just stay online for the survey that's going to be coming up because there are some books that are going to be handed out. And Daryl, again, please accept our thanks for, for joining us today. This has been a real treat. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real treat for me too. And thank you to everybody who participated. Uh, and uh, please stay healthy. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you sometime in the future. Thank you very thanks much. Thanks again, Daryl. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.